All right, we're going to move on with the second part of the tutorial. And uh, the next speaker is Christopher Rhoda, and he is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Missouri. And he's going to talk about resource selection functions. Okay, thank you, everybody, for, for being here today. Um, this is a much less intimate crowd than I was actually expecting here. Um, and so I brought one flash drive thinking there might be 20 people showing up. Um, but I do have all of the files that we want up on Dropbox. Does everybody have internet connection here? If you, if you're using, you should be able to use NR, um, NRC Guest, I think it's called. You just have to open a browser window and type in google.com or whatever to accept the term, and then our terms will come up and you should be able to check to accept them. If anyone's, is any, if anyone still has trouble with internet after that, raise your hand and I'll come around and talk about it. You've already accepted the terms and then, okay. Make sure you use the microphone, please. Okay. Um, and so to get to the files, let's let's just take a second to make sure that everybody can get into, into Dropbox. We'll just sign in with, with my account, and then you guys should be able to download um, the files as you need them onto your computer. And so let me just, I'm going to pull up a notepad. And so while I start out, why doesn't everyone try to get onto Dropbox? And then hopefully we'll all be there by the time we get to some of the places where we actually want to uh, fit some of these models. So email. Is just christopher.rota at gmail.com. That's my Gmail. And then the password for Dropbox. I'm sorry that this is not an easier password. Can everybody see that? Um, you guys probably can't see this over here. Huh? Do you know how to do that real quick? I'm new to Dropbox. So you log into Dropbox? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and do you know the file? Uh, everything on here. Everything? Yeah. So maybe you should move. Everything. I want everything. Yeah. All right. Can we just zip that? Do you have it uh, local on your Dropbox? I, I, local Dropbox. I do. Is that this? Um, no. Yeah, the Dropbox will be right there. Dropbox. This is all this. Yeah, and the under too. And that too. Yep. Everything. Right. Same two. We'll wait for this to update. Okay. Well, and then here in Dropbox, we, we can All right, share a link. I All see. Right? Yep. It's up on the bottom there. All right. And is this going to be an ugly looking link? Yeah. Send email. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Would it be easier just to let everyone log in? Right. This is this one. Good copy. And let us open. Yeah, you can put it in. Can you can put it in a notepad and make it bigger, huh? Nothing else we can put it in Word. Yeah. Here, give on. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for your help on that. I hope it works too.
you guys over here see that now? So this link should get you to a zip file that has all of the code and some of the data files and all the data files that we'll use um, in today's workshop. And let's work on, maybe you guys can work on downloading that while I give a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about today and then we can pull up those files individually. Uh, I am assuming that everybody has R on their computers. Um, I will be using some packages that you may or may not um, have up. So if you don't have those, maybe just bear with me um, or download them as we go. Um, and uh, if you don't have them, you can bear with me and you can uh, play around with fitting these models later. Okay, so today I will be talking um, about uh, resource selection functions and actually really only um, a small subset of, of what we might consider to be resource selection functions. Um, and really what I'm presenting today is going to barely scratch the surface of, of the ideas behind resource selection functions. Um, I want to get you guys just a little bit of code to fit some of the most basic models. Uh, 45 minutes is not nearly enough time to do a really um, thorough uh, evaluation of, of some of these methods. Um, and then uh, this will give you guys a start. You can play with it from there. Um, and as uh, I believe my email, my contact information should be on the, um, the registration forms. So feel free to, to follow up with me after this um, if there's any lingering questions uh, or if you guys uh, want to explore some of these topics um, a little bit further than what I'm able to cover in a quick 45-minute uh, tutorial today. So I'll start off with a big question of, of what is a resource selection function? And really, resource selection functions are, are defined quite broadly. Um, and here I'll call them um, really any set of statistical methods uh, that's used to quantify relationships uh, between animals uh, and their environment. And they, they span a wide different range of, of statistical methods. Um, from compositional analysis, uh, where we might have uh, an animal's home range and discrete habitats within an animal's home range, and we wish to quantify the relationships between an animal and the habitat in the home range. Species distribution models um, can largely be considered resource selection functions. Um, there's a huge range of, of literature um, on species distribution models, um, but many uh, species distribution models uh, can be considered resource selection functions. They quantify relationships between an animal uh, and their environment. Occupancy models, which we'll not talk about today, um, are also another example of what we might consider a, uh, a resource selection function, um, just like uh, logistic regression might be considered uh, a resource selection function. Um, maximum entropy might be considered a resource selection function. We have a sample of used um, places uh, where the animal was known to occur, we have some background set and we wish to quantify relationships between the animal and the environment. Uh, discrete choice as well. This is just a small list of, of what might fall under um, a broad umbrella of, of what we'll call uh, resource selection functions. And so I'm going to contrast just for today's talk two um, broad sampling schemes that we might be able to use to address uh, resource selection functions. Uh, one of these uh, was what we might call a use or, or a non-use type of a sampling scheme. Uh, this is where we might have uh, a predefined set of sample units. We go to those sample units and we survey for, for presence or absence or for uh, detection or non-detection. Uh, much like we might do if we are to um, have uh, an occupancy modeling type study. Um, we go to a site, survey it multiple times for detection, non-detection of an animal. Um, in the old days, it used to just be logistic regression. We'd go there once, the animal was there, it was not there. Um, we're largely going to disregard um, these use, non-use um, for this um, seminar today. There's whole workshops just just on occupancy models, uh, for example. Um, and so we're not going to have time to cover all of these today. Um, what I will talk about today um, in a little bit of detail is um, what we'll call a use uh, and availability type sampling scheme. 
And this is probably the closest link we have to this to, to today's seminar and this uh, big uh, movement symposium that we have going on here, right? Uh, when we have use uh, and availability type sampling, it's often because, say, we have a transmitter on an animal, um, and we have been tracking them um, for a very long time. And we know where they are. We have all these points across the landscape, but depending on the resolution, we don't necessarily know where they weren't, okay? Um, so we might have a set of, of, of places where we know where the animal was, and then we'll often have a second set of, of sample units where we think the animal could have occurred, but that there's no actual record of, of occurrence uh, at that place. We might call these pseudo-absences if we were working uh, within um, Maxent, or we might call them available sample units if we were, say, working with uh, discrete choice, uh, for example. Um, and there's actually many different kinds of models um, that we might be able to uh, fit to use uh, an availability type data. And uh, I've, I've come prepared, I don't know what, what the time is going to allow me to do today, um, to, to talk about um, all of these. Uh, I don't have maximum entropy, uh, as you might think of, in, in the MaxSense software package um, prepared to talk about today, but we can actually fit uh, maximum entropy models with uh, Poisson regression that equivalence has recently been demonstrated. And I do have a little bit of code for, for showing you guys how to do that today. So we'll just dive into some, some quick details of, of what we might consider um, a, a use and availability type sampling scheme. And this is, this is the sampling scheme I'll have in mind um, with, uh, with the data that I'll be showing you today and, and the models that we will be fitting. So we might have some, some sampling frame here, which is represented by the complete uh, rectangular grid. And we've broken it up into, uh, into several discrete units. And these points might represent the true locations where uh, an animal um, existed um, over, over our sampling frame. And we'll highlight those here with green. So the, this green is these discrete cells where an animal actually occurred in space. And with these models, we're then assuming that we're actually collecting a random sample of used locations from all of the used locations within our sampling frame. So we'll let the red here represent these cells where we actually observed uh, use um, by our animals. Okay, so now once we have established um, our random sample of, of used sample units, we then collect uh, from the background a random sample of what we'll call available sample units. Um, these are, might also be called pseudo-absence points if we were doing this, for example, in a Maxent framework. And those will be, be highlighted here with our yellow cells. Now notice that when we're collecting our background samples, we're collecting them without actual regard to whether a sample unit was used or not. So if we look at this sample unit right here, uh, this was actually used. It's highlighted green when we look at our population of used sample units within our, within our sample frame here. Um, but this one will land within um, our set of available sample units as well. Yes? I don't know how to do that. <laughs> um, I would need the tech guys to put the slides up over there. Um, can we do that for just a second? Yeah, but eventually I'm going to be running some R code over here. So, so maybe we'll just leave it be. Okay. So we're looking at our, our, our set of, of used, and we're looking at our set of, of available. Um, and this is one common way that we might um, be able to identify used sample units uh, and available sample units um, in, our, in our sample frame. Uh, another way to do it might be to actually pair one used sample unit with uh, one or many um, available sample units, and, and this is a commonly used uh, sampling scheme if we're using discrete choice models, for example. So um, in this case, I have both um, our population um, of used sample units. Red um, are those that we have sampled randomly. And now if we're doing this in a discrete choice environment, this is one possible way that we might be able to think about <clears throat> sampling available sample units where we might say this point was used, and we might say um, 
all of these yellow points surrounding this used point may have been available for use. Um, and we might actually call that a choice set in, within a discrete choice modeling framework. Um, there's actually many different ways that we might be able to identify those available samples if we are doing um, discrete choice. So if we had an animal's movement path and we had maybe an average distance between movements, um, we might be able to identify a, uh, the, the, the set of available units that would correspond to that used unit. Um, for example, by setting up a buffer and randomly selecting some sample units uh, within that buffer. Uh, if we're doing a, a discrete choice and we're interested in pairing used and available, we can have um, really as many available sample units as, as we can accommodate uh, in our model here. So there's no limit to the, to, the, to the pairing that we can do for a discrete choice type framework. And so we would call uh, this pairing of this used in the red and the available uh, in the yellow uh, one choice set. This would essentially be one observation um, in, in a use available, use available sampling scheme with a discrete choice model. So now that that's the broad overview, and this is kind of the context that we're working in with our use and um, availability type models, um, I was originally going to throw it to you guys and, and, and ask what you wanted, but I think what I'll do uh, instead is, is I'll just go through um, some of the models uh, that, we've, um, that I've pulled together here. Um, and then on the right, or I guess it's your guys' left over there, um, we'll pull up these models and, and we'll fit some of them uh, in R. So the first one that we will consider today um, will be a, a discrete choice model. This is where we have a used sample unit and we've paired with one or more um, available sample units. And we'll, we can call uh, this, this Y, I, this is um, the choice set that we have um, defined for, uh, for site I here, okay? And in discrete choice uh, modeling, we can consider um, that a multinomial random variable uh, with essentially um, uh, an n equals to 1 here, all right? Um, in wind bugs, we would call this a, a categorical uh, distribution. And so we'll define um, our y um, uh, at site i, or observation i, um, as, a, as a series of ones and zeros. So y here can be 1 or 0 um, at uh, choice set 1 all the way up through choice set s. Now, only one of these values can be 1. Um, the rest are going to be 0 based on how we've defined our, our multinomial model here. The, uh, the value of y that is equal to 1 is the sample unit that was, that was chosen. That is our red sample unit uh, here in the middle there. The rest are the available sample units within our choice set. Uh, we have a corresponding probability of selection uh, for each of those uh, sample units within our choice set, um, and the sum of the probability of selection has to sum to 1 as a condition of our multinomial model. And then under discrete choice modeling, um, the probability that any of these sample units are used um, is, is equivalent to uh, this expression here. So th this, this uh, is a matrix or a vector of, um, of covariates. Uh, that we might be interested in analyzing. So for the examples I'll show today, um, this might be a diameter of breast height, basal area surrounding a focal tree, and whether that focal tree is dead or not. And this beta is your, your regular, your usual um, vector of, of regression coefficients. So, and, and, and then we sum over um, this term over all of our choice sets so that we have the probability of uh, any y um, summing to 1. So we essentially normalize it um, by exponentiating the utility functions over all of our um, choice sets. So let's play around with a little bit of code for, for fitting this model. Let's see, we'll get to the mixed effects model in a second here. Um, so there's a couple of R packages that we can use to fit a discrete choice type model. Um, the one I'll talk about today and give code for today is uh, this uh, mlogit function uh, within R. And that can actually do quite a bit. I'm barely going to scratch the surface on, on fitting a discrete choice model uh, with mlogit. This mclogit is mixed conditional logit, um, and you can fit 
random intercept models. Um, you cannot fit random slopes models with this MC logit package in R. And I'll talk shortly here um, about uh, the, make the, uh, the random slopes model. So let me pull up some R code for this one. Um, have you all been able to download the files from Dropbox, those that are interested in doing so? kind of give a, a step by step discussion through what some of this some of this code is doing here so the top code is is just setting the working directory and if you're working through this on your computer make sure you set this to the working directory where you have the data stored let me let me take a step backwards here what I opened up for those of you that are following along on your computers is the, this file discrete choice mlogit.r and the data associated with that will be bbwo.xlsx. There's a couple of libraries that we'll want to load so that we can fit this in R. Um, I like to store my data um, as an XLS file. Um, I know that there's a lot of folks that don't like to use Excel, but it's a little easier for me. Um, there's no reason that you couldn't read this in as a comma-separated value um, or a text, the tab delineated file, whatever you want to use. Uh, this mlogit library, geez, I'm not even going to try to put the pointer over there. This mlogit library is what houses the, the functions for running your discrete choice model uh, within R. And then I just have here um, a library for generating random values from multi multivariate normal. Um, and we'll, we'll see where this comes into place a little later for, for calculating uh, bootstrap confidence intervals. So here I'm reading in my data, and I'll give you a, a quick summary of, of what we're looking at. Sometimes the XLS, XLSX function takes a second. And while it does that, let me just pull up the data so we can see what we're looking at here. Oh, it's up. So this data here is from some of my dissertation research um, where I had some uh, transmitters on blackback woodpeckers that were occupying um, <clears throat> burn forests, mountain pine beetle infestations in the Black Hills. Uh, and we have a um, series of trees that we observe the woodpeckers uh, foraging on. These are our used sample units. We then defined uh, their home range uh, using kernel density techniques and we selected uh, random uh, trees within their home range that we considered available uh, for use. Um, we did not observe whether those available trees had actually been used for woodpeckers or not. Some of them clearly had, um, but we never observed use on those trees. And the covariates that we'll be uh, discussing today will be um, tree diameter. Um, so the diameter of breast height of the focal tree that we observed the woodpecker uh, using. Uh, the basal area surrounding that focal tree and whether or not um, the focal tree was dead um, or alive. So this is a dummy variable uh, with values equal to 0 or 1. And we're just going to fit two models real quickly here. I don't like the way the compressed screen has changed my code. Um, so let's make this look a little bit more intuitive. So for, for fitting our discrete choice model, um, we've loaded uh, the package mlogit, and then the function, um, not surprisingly, is, is also called uh, mlogit. Let me take a step backwards. It's why here, just so we, we're all on the same page when we're uh, thinking about um, the data here. Uh, the y takes on a value of 1 if uh, this site, uh, if a tree was observed to be used, and it takes on a value of 0 if the tree was uh, not used. Um, and so we've got our predictors in here, um, tree diameter, uh, tree basal area, whether the focal tree was dead or not. Um, and, and then we have this uh, conditioning on zero. 
And, and what this is telling MLogit to do is to suppress the uh, intercept terms. Uh, so in, in discrete choice modeling, we don't have uh, an intercept term, and I, and I thought I would have a, a whiteboard or something to, to write on here. Uh, we don't have an, an intercept term in the sense that you might um, think of it with uh, the classic linear regression. Um, and this is because of the way that we um, calculate the probability um, that sample, that choice set, uh, what do we call, how do we index choice sets here by S um, is used. Um, if we had a, a common intercept term, um, it would cancel from the numerator. Um, and so we don't have uh, intercept terms in the way we might think of in uh, classic uh, linear regression. Um, M logit um, will by default fit an intercept term. Um, but what this is, is essentially a um, different coefficient for each of your choice sets. So if you have five choice sets, it's going to uh, introduce uh, five um, uh, slopes that will be, or, or intercepts that will be unique to each of those choice sets. Um, if you're modeling, um, for example, clearly categorical choice sets, as is often done in economics, whether somebody bought a yacht or um, an airplane or whatnot, you might have those, those clear interpretations. Um, for this kind of a discrete choice model where we've just got continuous um, and, and a categorical variable of whether a tree is alive or dead, um, those choice specific intercepts might not make sense. And so if you're fitting this within MLogit, make sure that you um, set that um, conditioning equal to zero so you don't have the, the slope parameter. Um, we're reading in the data now, there's a couple of different ways within MLogit that you might be able to specify the data itself. You might have a long form um, or what they call a wide form. I prefer the long form, but you can play around with those different things. The long form gives one observation per row of the data. And also within the MLogit function, um, we have what's called a choice ID variable. Um, and this uh, is essentially used for pairing your um, used sample unit with your available sample unit. Um, because remember that the, what, what, what's counted as, 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 as the observation is actually um, the pairing of the used uh, and the available sample units. So if you had one used and 15 available sample units, that's still only considered one observation um, in, a, in a discrete choice model. Um, and so I have defined my choice ID variable in, in this case just as group. Um, and so for every used sample unit here um, identified by group, I have a corresponding available sample unit and they all have a unique identifier, one, two, three, four, five, on down the line. Um, our studio truncates this at, uh, at 1,000 observations and I have more than 1,000 used observations. So but you can see how the group variable changes uh, as a, for each observation. Okay. <coughs> and then this is just the alternative variable. Uh, MLogit needs you to specify this alternative variable for some reason. Um, probably when we're thinking about purely categorical um, choices, did you buy a yacht, did you buy an airplane, uh, et cetera, it's, it's sufficient to just put your response variable as your alternative variable in here. And so we're just going to fit uh, real quick here um, two different discrete choice models. The, the differences between the two of these um, is for one of them, um, I have this uh, dummy variable as to whether the focal tree was dead or not. And in another one, I'm suppressing um, that um, focal dead. And these fit in a snap. And then um, if we wanted to do some model selection on these two, for example, um, it's a super easy function within R. I'm sure you guys are all pros at this. Um, simply um, AIC, and then uh, we specify the name of the model under there. Um, and here uh, we, 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 we've got some simple model selection showing that by far uh, model one uh, is the best. There's no um, ambiguity in this one. But that's just a little bit of code for um, model selection for those that are interested in that. 
So interpreting um, predictions from a discrete choice um, can often be a little bit of a challenge, and I've struggled with this uh, a little bit in the past. Um, and this is because when we're predicting whether a uh, sample unit was used, um, we're doing this relative to all of the other sample units that are located within our particular choice set, okay? So if we have two choice sets for observation I, um, we might have a fairly high probability of choosing one rather than the other. We might have a 55% probability of choosing one and a 45% probability of choosing the other, and they have to sum to one. If we have 20, if we have one used and 19 available within our choice sets, our predictions of relative probabilities still have to sum to one, but now we might have a 6% chance of, of um, using the choice set that was observed at, and then um, a 94% chance of, of using all the others, and it has to sum up over 19. And so predictions, uh, the, the scale of your predicted probability of use will vary, um, actually, depending on how many um, sample units you have within your choice set, essentially how many available samples you have uh, within your choice set. Um, and so I'll go through here how to plot what we'll call the utility of, of uh, one um, choice, um, and then we'll go ahead and, and plot some predicted probabilities of, of use. Uh, and so the first thing we're going to want to do, well, okay, I'm gonna just take a step backwards, and I'm going to say that the predict function the predict function in general is, is, is all right, but the predict function for amlogit is, is, is actually quite non-intuitive. Um, and I find it much better that when I'm um, plotting uh, predictions um, to actually custom write a little bit of code to plot these predictions. And, uh, and this code will just walk you guys through that real quick. So we're storing our betas for model one. And, and these are our uh, fitted um, slope parameters that we have down in the lower left hand corner there. And we're also going to um, extract the uh, covariance matrix of these fitted parameters and we do that um, uh, in order to um, plot predictions over a range and to get standard errors of those predictions uh, over the range of X. Um, so what we get is a 3 by 3 matrix. On the diagonal we have the variance of our um, particular parameters. If you take the square root of that variance, you get the uh, standard error of the uh, <coughs> diameter, basal area, focal dead. Um, and then uh, on the off diagonals here, the covariance between those different parameters. We're going to use those when, when plotting our response. Um, we're just here setting some um, the, the x variables over which we want to uh, view our response curve. So we're going to we're we're, we're going to look at the uh, the change in utility with um, diameter of breast height over the range of of diameter of breast height we observed for this data, which is the sequence command here from from a min to max diameter observed. We're going to divide that up into 100, and then we're just going to keep focal dead fixed at one, and basal area fixed at the mean basal area we observed for our woodpeckers. And then this uh, function here, uh, what I've called utility is, is this part right here without uh, being exponentiated. So it's just uh, the values of x that we wish to predict over uh, multiplied by our fitted coefficients. Um, and in the discrete choice literature, this is what we might call our uh, utility function. And now this is what the predict function does in the background. Um, when you are calculating standard errors over uh, your range of, of variables. Um, I've got it written in a little loop here. We're going to call it uh, utility standard error for each uh, value of x that we're wishing to um, predict over. Um, and essentially what we are doing here is we've got our covariance matrix here and we are pre-multiplying and post-multiplying that by our vector of uh, uh, re uh, fitted regression coefficients. Uh, this is because we're calculating a linear um, uh, function of a multivariate uh, normal, multi, um, multivariate normal random variable. And so this is how you calculate the 
variance of a multivariate normal random variable um, is you pre and, and, and post multiply those linear predictors by your covariance matrix, um, and it gives you the, the standard error. Or you take the square root, and it gives you the standard error. This is what predict does in the background, um, but I find it easier just to, to, to do that myself. And I'll go ahead and we'll plot the utility. And uh, we had uh, quite a small uh, variance in our um, uh, dBH, diameter at breast height coefficient. Um, and we see that over the range of, of diameter at breast height uh, that we observed the woodpeckers uh, using, um, that uh, the larger the tree, the greater the utility <coughs> of that tree to, um, to the blackback woodpeckers. Um, this, this solid line here is the mean. Uh, utility, and then these uh, dashed lines here represent 95% confidence intervals. Now, as, as I've been talking about earlier, that, that predicted utility is, is not always um, intuitive, right? What does... Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. What does the utility of 9 mean relative to a utility of five. And so often the way I like to visualize these uh, discrete choice models is with uh, the relative probability of selecting a choice relative to um, another choice that might have some fixed attribute, uh, which is what I'll pull up real quick here. I have 15 minutes left. So I'm, I'm not going to walk through the R code here. I'm just going to plot it. I'm sorry? So I'm just doing some bootstrap confidence intervals here, which is why it's taking just a second. So what I'm doing here while this is running is, is I'm actually assuming two choice sets well, within this data set. Um, and I'm calculating the probability that um, a sample unit is, is selected um, given, here we go. <clears throat> Probability a sample unit is selected when it has uh, this uh, value for diameter breast height relative to a sample unit being selected um, when it uh, has the mean um, diameter breast height that we observed. And so we're, we're, we're just looking at two choice sets here um, in our predictions. And so uh, there's, there's not much variation here. There's actually no variation here because oh, this is assuming a, a woodpecker has a choice between two identical trees. And under the assumptions of our discrete choice model, uh, when you have two identical um, choices, you'll choose one of them with um, probability 50%, which is how it scales in the y-axis here. Um, at small diameter breast height relative to the mean diameter breast height, we'll have a low relative probability of using that tree. And as diameter breast height um, increases, uh, our woodpeckers are, are um, almost certainly going to pick um, that tree with uh, the larger diameter breast height relative to the um, tree that we have here um, on, with, with, with our mean diameter breast height. OK. So that is the very, um, let me just keep now that's kind of your bare bones um, discrete choice model fit to fit to use and availability data, um, and quite often in in fish and wildlife we're not actually interested in fitting these bare bones models. Um, we'd be more interested in, in fitting um, uh, perhaps uh, perhaps a mixed effects model, um, which is uh, I've got some wind bugs code. I'm going to let it run in the background while I talk about some, a, a couple of other things here. Um, 
if you're wanting to fit a discrete choice model with a random slope, so, so I've already talked a little bit about why we might not have a random intercept, um, at least within this kind of a context. Um, we would have to have a different intercept for every choice set. It might not be um, easy to um, interpret what a different uh, intercept would be for all of our choice sets for my woodpecker data. Um, but we could easily interpret, uh, say, a, a random slopes model, right? So for my woodpeckers, I had 30 or more observations on individual woodpeckers. Um, so we might think that a uh, choice of a tree uh, would have been correlated um, among particular woodpeckers. So we can fit, say, a random slopes model um, where uh, we would have a different slope parameter for um, each woodpecker corresponding to their probability of selecting um, a tree of a certain size. Um, and then we might assume um, some uh, distribution for that uh, random slope. Um, it's probably going to be most common to, to assume some slope is, uh, slopes are normally distributed across all of our woodpeckers with some population mean mu and um, some variation. And there is uh, no uh, straightforward way to do this in, in preformed R packages that I am familiar with. Um, and it, it, it's actually much easier anyways to fit this um, within a Bayesian context. It makes uh, the predictions a little bit easier um, to interpret. And I've got some code um, for fitting this same model, um, but with a, a random slopes, a, a mixed effects discrete choice model um, in WinBugs. I know that I'm still a little old school using WinBugs, but so be it. go to the desktop. And for fitting this in, in WinBugs, this is the file called discretechoicebugs.r. And rather than walk you through the code and, and torture you more with that, I'm just going to run all of this. And, and we're going to let it run in the background. And I'll just pull up. our bugs code for fitting this model here. So as I alluded to earlier, we're assuming um, this multinomial model um, for, our, for our choice sets, or our observations of choice sets. Um, we can specify that multinomial model in WinBugs um, as uh, dcat, which is the categorical distribution. Um, and this just requires you to specify um, a vector of probabilities, and those probabilities have to sum to one. Um, here's the utility functions I have highlighted here. Um, this is the same utility function that I plotted um, earlier on the scale between 0 to 10 for the, for the woodpeckers. Uh, we're calculating the relative probability of use, and then we're storing into a single vector um, the relative probability of using any of our choice sets. Um, and we have specified up here um, a random slope for the selection uh, coefficient for um, diameter of breast height. Um, and then we just, we're not going to dive into the code here. You guys can look at the code that's available for you for you on, on Dropbox here. But we essentially specify um, a, a value of that random slope for um, each group, um, which I defined as an individual woodpecker. So there's our discrete choice mixed effects model. OK, I've got this up here. And I've, I've used up almost all of my time talking about discrete choice. Um, I'm just going to give a very quick overview of, of a couple of other models um, that we might be able to fit to, to use and availability data, use and availability data before uh, wrapping up here. Um, so, so the next one I'm going to talk about is what I'll call a case control model uh, with contaminated controls. Um, this was a model originally introduced in the, in the economics literature, and it's been, uh, there's been a couple of papers uh, recently published on this model. Um, but essentially now, we're, we're moving out of this idea of, of a choice set where we have a used sample unit that's paired with available sample units. 
and we just set our, our response y equal to 1 if we observed use um, and 0 if we observed um, availability. And in this context, an available sample unit um, may truly have been unused um, or an available sample unit may have, have been used but we didn't observe use there. Uh, we call those uh, cases uh, contaminated controls. Uh, historically, we've called zeros in, in logistic regression uh, our controls. We've now got contaminated controls where it might have actually been used, uh, but we never observed use on there. Um, we're going to assume a, a simple model for our, for our observations. It's just going to be a Bernoulli random variable. But we've got a bit more complicated of an expression that we might, than we might have for, say, logistic regression. Um, this might be the true probability uh, that uh, one of our uh, sample units uh, was uh, used, not accounting, f so, so this would be the true uh, probability, not the probability of, of observing use. Um, and then we would um, apply this case control adjustment that, that accounts for um, prevalence, which we're going to have here with the parameter rho. Um, that essentially is the um, the absolute probability that any of our sample units are used um, in the background, and then we're going to uh, also account for the number of used samples uh, that we have collected and the number of, of available samples that we have collected. Um, now, this, this model is not available uh, in, in our packages, and so I was, I was hoping to have a little more time to actually walk through uh, writing functions, but I'll at least show you the function and you can play around with it at home uh, later if you want to. Um, there is some, some custom written code that you guys can find in some recently published papers. Um, I've got a paper in Journal of Animal Ecology that, that has this model. And actually the Hellbender data um, that I'm not going to be able to talk about today um, uh, included as an annotated appendix. And this is also um, some of the Hellbender data is deposited in Dryad so you guys can play around with that on your own if you like. Um, there's some annotated code from a recent paper in Ecology as well. Um, discussing uh, this particular model. Um, and then there's a, a very closely related model, which uh, I'll just call the weighted distribution. Um, this uh, has, has been recently republished by Andy Royal on uh, Company and Methods in Ecology and Evolution. It was originally published um, by Lele and Keim in, in Ecology in, in 2006. There is some code for fitting this model in that Dropbox package I sent you, but I don't think I'll have time to actually talk about this today. Um, now, uh, this case control model uh, with contaminated controls, there has recently been um, a, a spate of papers back and forth in the literature regarding how best to interpret these models. And um, when we're fitting use and availability data, um, it's best not to try to predict absolute probabilities of use. We're thinking more about um, predicting relative probabilities of use or relative odds uh, of use. Although if we do have knowledge of, of prevalence, if, if, if we have knowledge of the unconditional probability that any of our sample units within our sample frame are used, um, we can then begin to interpret predictions from this case control model um, or the, the weighted distribution as absolute probabilities of use uh, with use and availability data. Okay, so, so what do we got here? We have some, um, some wind bugs results from our mixed effects discrete choice model and we won't worry about looking so so we can look at this and those that are familiar with Bayesian modeling can see that these parameters um, these, these are our MCMC chains these parameters have converged um, pretty nicely we're probably gonna get an R hat of one or very close to one yeah so this model converged nicely and so what we get here um, when fitting our mixed effects discrete choice model um, is, is, is we can get an estimate of the random slope coefficient for all of our woodpeckers. Um, the variation in that slope um, over all woodpeckers. Um, and then estimates of our fixed effects for our other remaining coefficients, our, our basal area coefficient, um, our focal dead uh, coefficient. And we can actually see that these are pretty close to what we got uh, when, when fitting MLOGIT. And the way MCMC sampling works is, is we're sampling random values from the posterior um, distribution of each of these parameters. And we can actually summarize these nicely. Um, 
we'll just do one of these. So this here might be a um, an approximation to the posterior distribution of the focal dead fixed effects coefficient that we had um, from our uh, previous model. Um, we can see that the the mean here closely approximates what we had uh, for the for the fixed effects model uh, in M logit, um, and this variance will actually closely approximate the variance we had from our fixed effects model as well. Um, but this is how we might start to be able to summarize our, our distributions. We can then use this MCMC um, output in order to make predictions much like I did earlier. Um, now we would just uh, calculate relative probability of use as a function of um, these random simulations um, from the posterior distribution. So let's fit real quick a case control model. Did I pull that up already? Now, let's fit real quick a case control model to the same woodpecker data, and then I'll take any questions that you guys might have. Okay, I do a, a much better job um, when I don't have a scrunched screen of. Um, spacing and indenting this code. Um, it looks a little bit better. So there's no custom written code for this case control model with contaminated controls. And so what you need to start doing if, if you want to fit this model is move outside your, your canned packages, your mlogit, your, your GLM. Um, and, and it's a good idea to learn the basic um, way to use a function in R. I don't have the time to discuss this um, in at any detail today. Um, let's back up here. But uh, in this function, I specify all of the equations uh, that we have up on the screen here. And then we can see, um, I'm assuming, a binomial likelihood. Um, and so there's actually a nice uh, function for that within R. Um, and this is, this is a function that calculates the uh, negative sum of the log likelihood, and, and we calculate the negative sum just because that is what the optim function likes. And so then we'll go to case control. And then once we have specified Once we have specified um, our function, like we did on the previous screen, we can then use this optim function with an R. And, and what that does is it essentially searches over the parameter space and it returns to us um, the maximum likelihood estimates of, of, our, of our model, essentially. And there's a lot of code in here that I have no time to talk to you guys about today. Um, fit, let's see, did I already fit that one? I fit We'll fit two models. We'll do the same model selection that we've done before. Um, now, instead of using the nice AIC function, though, you need to manually calculate AIC, which is not a, a difficult computation. Um, but we also see the same unambiguous model selection that we did when fitting our, our multinomial logit. Um, and we can actually produce the nice same graphs as we did. Um, And it actually doesn't look much different in this, in this point. We're getting the same answers. Um, but what we have up here is the, uh, is, is the log odds of, of use. Um, we, I, was, I was talking earlier, we don't really want to um, interpret uh, predictions from this case control model as absolute probabilities of use. Uh, and so um, to calculate these, I actually suppressed the intercept parameter and then just calculated uh, the log odds uh, of use from, um, the, from the slope coefficients and the values of x that I wished to calculate um, uh, the log odds over. And all of that code is, is, is up on Dropbox, plus much more that I unfortunately didn't get to talk about today. Um, but it's lunchtime, but if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to field any questions.
appreciate it, Chris. Does anybody have any questions? I had a real general question, so maybe it's better to talk to you about it later. But I, I just wondered if you have any any guidance on like how to design the sampling. You know, when you have choices, because I've worked a lot with occupancy, and there you separate out detection, and, and you've got presence and absence data. Repeat this question. Yeah. So, so, so I just wondered if you could give some guidance on like what are the preferred sampling sort of schemes. Okay, so, so the question is a little guidance on some preferred sampling schemes for um, use uh, and availability data. Yeah. And um, this today was presented in, a, uh, in the context of an animal with a radio uh, transmitter on them. And so we assume, and it may be more or less valid, that we, we don't have to worry about detection probabilities. We've got a transmitter on the animal so we can know when, where it is uh, at will. Um, and so we're, that's how we're collecting our used sampling is. And, and it's up to the researcher to determine um, an appropriate spacing, for example, um, on, on transmitted animals. Um, I was fitting models up here that uh, would assume that each uh, choice set or each uh, observation would be independent. But if, if we had um, individuals uh, that, that we got a, a location on every 10 minutes, that might not be. Um, very valid, um, and we would have to fit a more complicated model than what I was showing up here. For my woodpeckers, uh, I took an observation once a day. They had small home ranges. They could traverse the home range in an hour. Um, as for available sample units, um, there's, there's a, a wide range of, of what might be appropriate um, depending on the, uh, on the context. So for, for my woodpeckers, I would consider something as available if it was within the home range of, of that woodpecker. If we're doing discrete choice modeling, we might be able to define a movement path, for example, and uh, maybe identify what's the average distance an animal would move between these two locations, and we might be able to define a choice set um, uh, that's within some spatial proximity um, based on, on, on how frequently we relocated them and, and how far that they would move. Um, but defining what's available really should be based on the, the, the biology of the animal. And, and it's, it's, it's critically important, but there's not necessarily clear guidance for defining um, what's available. You know, what's available for a dispersing animal might be um, a, a broad swath within North America, and it might be hard to sample from that. Um, for my woodpeckers, it was easy because I was just uh, interested in inference within the home range, and so I could define availability by the home range. Um, so choice of available sample units is critical for fitting these models, but it, there's not necessarily always straightforward guidance. You have to consider the biology of, of, of the critter that you're, of your, you're using. Do the models how you specify them force the animal to move, or is there a possible that they can choose to stay resident within the, the, the cell that they're in? Yeah, so there's, there's actually no reason that um, they couldn't stay resident. My, my models actually themselves don't have um, movement explicit in them. It's just kind of the outcome of the movement process. I found an animal um, in this tree, but for some of my animals, I, they, I had them in, in, in a couple of different trees, and you would assume sampling is replacement. Has it been done um, sort of a temporal hierarchical um, effort? This? So we, we, we just ran this with a daily time step, and we ended up So you're asking if, if folks have um, combined different temporal scales of selection into uh, the same model? Yeah. You know, I mean, with, with some of these things, you're getting a crazy time interval. It's really low. And so, like, if you got to step out to something larger. Mm -hmm. We stepped out to a, a one-day time step. So, well, that's interesting, but you know, is that really of more interest to us as biologists if we're looking at it on a weekly time step? Multiple time steps within one 
Yeah. Um, you know, so, so, so a, a disclaimer is I'm not a, a spatiotemporal guy at all, so I can't speak um, about maybe uh, spatiotemporal models that we might be able to fit. Um, but maybe another way we could do it if we wanted to think about each observation is, is, um, is independent would just be how we would define available. So maybe if you wanted available over, um, or you wanted to define, um, you know, a, a weekly choice, you might say, well, what's available to this animal over this week? And make that your definition of available, um, if, if that's the um, scale of, of inference that you wish to make. Um, that might not be a very satisfying answer. Yeah. Okay, thank you everybody for coming. We're going to conclude.